tackle the nomenclature of the mouthpiece. First you have the tenon, the, and that's mostly on a clarinet, though very old saxophone players had tenon joints too. I'll be demonstrating all of these uh, so you can see the parts. And you want to make sure that the cork is firm enough that there's not a lot of play in the mouthpiece in the barrel tenon. There's the shoulder of the mouthpiece, which is what stops the mouthpiece when it goes in to the barrel. There's the body of the mouthpiece. That's the whole outside of the mouthpiece. Mouthpieces are made with a lot of different materials, and the material in your mouthpiece is important. And uh, whether it's rubber or ebonite or plastic or glass or any of the exotic materials, uh, they're all going to play different, even with the same facing. The beak, of course, is the part that you put in your mouth. There's a lot of shapes of beaks. Some are wider, some are smaller. And the wider ones, of course, open your mouth, which facilitates a darker tone. The smaller ones, of course, facilitate a brighter tone because it's closing your teeth on the mouthpiece and uh, making the chamber of your mouth smaller. There's the bite. The bite is simply the closest part of the beak to your the end of the mouthpiece to where you put it in your mouth. And uh, there's a lot of differences in bite as far as how far people put a mouthpiece in their mouth. Some teachers teach to put the teeth on the mouthpiece at the very end. Some teachers teach to take a little more mouthpiece and some teachers don't ever talk about how much mouthpiece you should put in your mouth. So that's another thing a mouthpiece maker looks at when they're watching you play. How much how much mouthpiece do you put in your mouth? And that's going to help them determine where to make the first cut on the mouthpiece. There's the table of the mouthpiece. That's where the reed fits on the mouthpiece. For me, it needs to be flat. That's another big controversy amongst mouthpiece makers. Uh, nowadays, mouthpieces are made with uh, CNC machines. Uh, very few are made by hand for mouthpiece makers, unless they're a small maker like myself. Even with CNC machines, a thousandth of an inch makes a lot of difference. So I believe that the, the table has to be completely flat, and I believe that when you get a mouth, most mouthpieces, they aren't flat. Some mouthpiece makers like to put a little dip in the middle of it, uh, in the middle of the table, and they say that causes suction. I don't believe that, so I don't do it. Many mouthpiece makers do it. And in fact, I play a couple of mouthpieces that have that hollowed out spot. I don't notice the difference, but uh, the mouthpiece works good anyway, so I play it. The window is the part of the mouthpiece that the reed fits over that's open. And it works along with the tip rail and the side rails. And these are very important measurements as it determines how much air gets into your instrument. A lot of people say that uh, smaller tip rails are important and I like smaller tip rails but I have mouthpieces with wider tip rails and to me the, the tip rail and the side rails, the thickness of them, as long as they don't inhibit the size of the window, it doesn't make any difference. Usually the wider tip rails and side rails make the mouthpiece smaller where you blow into and uh, you're not able to get as much air through the instrument. So that's why a lot of people prefer the, the thinner rails. The next thing we talk about is the baffle. It's the uh, part opposite the window of the mouthpiece and uh, it controls the brightness and darkness to the most extent of your mouthpiece. A higher baffle will give you a brighter sound and uh, of course then a baffle that's farther away from your reed will give you a darker sound. There's many different shapes of baffles and it's kind of like an airplane wing. And as an airplane wing, when the air goes over the surface, it either lifts or falls down. So that particular measurement becomes a very important part of uh, making a mouthpiece work. Uh, below the baffle, you have the chamber. 
Sometimes chambers are too big, sometimes they're too small, sometimes they have to be bored out, sometimes material has to be made to put in there to make them correct for any particular musician. The baffle tip is about an eighth of an inch from the tip of the mouthpiece. And a lot of times we go for what's called a rollover at the tip, which is a, a rather severe bump near the tip. And that really helps get the air moving down the mouthpiece. Then we have the tip opening. The tip opening is the actual distance between the reed and the tip of the mouthpiece. And the opening controls, again, how much air you can put in the mouthpiece. Uh, it also controls the back pressure of the mouthpiece to some extent. It's interesting how concept plays a role in the tip opening because uh, I, I work movies with a friend of mine, Don Marquise, and he and I play completely different, but we sound exactly the same. He uses one of my mouthpieces, but he likes a long lay and a very wide tip opening and a very soft reed. I like a medium lay with a medium hard reed and a medium tip opening, but we sound exactly the same. When they write solos for, for us, no one can tell which one of us are playing it. So again, concept becomes part of all of these parts that we're talking about on the mouthpiece. Uh, we have the bore, which is the part nearest the barrel. Usually the bore should be the same size as the clarinet. It's uh, not mandatory, but again, every thousandth of an inch is important. We have the final part is the ramp. The ramp is right below the window and it ends behind the table. It's inside the mouthpiece, right under the table. 